All right, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for our Prevention Peer Network webinar, Gaming Against Violence, Video Games as a Violence Prevention Tool. We are going to have a really exciting day. We have a fabulous guest speaker that we had the honor to meet last year and are really glad we could bring him today. Um, first though, Miranda and I from the partnership are going to go over um, a couple of background things. For those of you that need a little Zoom refresher, I know we're in, I think it's year four of the pandemic at this point, but just in case um, folks should be muted, um, you can unmute yourself. Uh, we would love to see faces when people are speaking. It's also helpful for our ASL interpreters. So you have the ability to turn your cameras on and off. However, if you can't for some reason, that's understandable. You can put things in the chat. Closed captioning should be enabled um, for folks and um, you have the ability to raise your hand as well as add some fun reactions and expressions throughout using the reactions button. So we're just gonna do a quick land acknowledgement as well. Um, so we acknowledge that we are on the homeland, uh, on the traditional territory and homelands of California native peoples. These nations include over 120 federally recognized tribes and many other non-recognized tribes that are all very culturally diverse. We thank these nations for their generosity and we keep them in our hearts and thoughts as we are in the space today, this week and every day. And um, I'm gonna put in the chat um, a link so that way um, folks can find out whose lands they are on if you aren't already aware. Um, you can also text the number that is gonna be listed as well. If I can copy paste. There we go. So we don't have the time, unfortunately, for everyone to come off mute and to hear who they all are, but we would love to know who is here. So if you can please type in the chat, your name, your pronouns, your agency, your role, and your lands, um, that would be fantastic. So this is our prevention team. Um, so today you have with us um, myself and Miranda. Um, I am Kimmy Remus, she, her pronouns. I'm a prevention specialist at the partnership. Um, and I'm calling in from Susquehannock, Piscataway and Nintego lands. Um, Miranda, would you like to take a second to introduce yourself? Oh, you're on mute. You would think after so many years, I consistently do this. So my name is Miranda Stiers. I am the Associate Director of Prevention here at the Partnership. I use they, them pronouns, and I am joining from the lands of the Nisenan, Miwok, and Maidu people in what is now known as Sacramento. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So I am going to get started just with some background. Um, now, this is um, what I took from a report from Common Sense Media. Um, Common Sense Media, just for those of you who don't know, is a great nonprofit. Um, it's research back and it is a great source for getting different information about youth and um, media use, whether that's social media, video games, TV shows, they have education guides, they have parent guides. Um, so it's a really awesome resource. I'll put that in the chat as well for folks. Um, so that way they can uh, access and look up things at another time. Um, so this came from their uh, census that they did in 2021. So a couple of years ago, but still very relevant. Um, just to give an idea of how much our teens and tweens using because I think we sometimes like go, oh my God, like what's up with the youth and all their technology? Um, and so we can see here that this is about average daily use. Um, and so, you know, things are pretty in line with each other um, and about what it looks like. Um, 
there are a couple of differences, um, you know, in between these two. Um, it seems that teens might use um, this a little bit more than tweens do. Maybe that has to do with parental restrictions. We don't know. Um, there also are some minor differences between things like gender, race, ethnicity, and household income. I want to point out that um, this is a binary report, though. It's not, unfortunately, looking into um, the uh, queer youth um, who are maybe gender nonconforming or non-binary, such as says girls and boys. Um, but just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we got going on there. Um, and to continue, um, so are they a big deal, video games? Um, and I would say that they are. Um, for folks that enjoy this activity a lot, um, I think a lot is an interesting uh, measure because it had other measures as well. There could be youth that are using these outlets, but less frequently, of course, too. Um, and so we can see that maybe online videos, particularly with TikTok these days are very popular, but video games, particularly with tweens that are very impressionable age. So if we're um, like thinking it's starting off at age eight, if almost half of tweens enjoy video games a lot, that is a, that's a big number in my opinion. And so we also um, can see from this report that um, with, and when it says mobile games, it means using either a console of some sort, like people like their like Switch or Twitch. I'm, I'm not as familiar with these things um, in, um, or with their phone games as opposed to like other traditional video games, which might be through like an Xbox, a PlayStation or a computer console. So that's the differentiate. Oh, it does say down at the bottom what that's referring to, um, what those different consoles are. And so we can see um, queens using mobile games, again, almost half every day, almost half enjoy them a lot. Um, and then for, teens um we're looking a little bit a, a little bit lower maybe they have some more extracurriculars you know if they have sports practice things like that they might not have the same ability um to do it quite as frequently as the tweens do again these are um theories uh but we we can only uh extrapolate so much from this and this is still a limited sample it's got I think about 28,000 people they were able to connect with for this um, but we know there are a lot more teens and tweens out there in the world than that. I am going to pass to Miranda now um, so that they can talk about um, some of the history around violence and video games. Yeah so for I guess it's historical context given my age. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thinking about like when video games first really started, um, I remember that I, with my first job, I was selling new and used video games, and that's when the very first Mortal Kombat had come out on the Super or the Nintendo 64 and Sega Genesis, and there is this huge fear of, oh, it's going to increase violence. Um, and video games were consistently being blamed for folks' violent behavior, um, kind of ignoring that violence has always existed in society um, and it's completely disregarding the very clear um, risk and protective factors in our in our communities so there's been a, a lot of like anecdotal information of the you know there's a clear connection between video games and aggressive behavior um, and pointing to those who have committed acts of violence um, i know especially after the shooting in columbine um there was a huge push and it when video games was um were shown to like not be the cause then they started going to music it just kind of became this continuous thing but if you look at the numbers of how many people are playing video games, particularly in the slides that Kimmy had shared with how many tweens and teens, um, you also have folks from my generation in their 40s um, to 50s who are playing video games. And 
um, they have found that it actually can curb violent behaviors. Um, so there's there's a lot of misinformation out there. So I encourage folks if it seems really kind of that clickbait, oh my gosh, this is happening. Take that with a grain of salt and really look into what those sources are. And if we can go forward, thank you. Yep. We are back to me now. So can we, okay, I think my spotlight is showing. Uh, so some news around video games, because um, there is some more context around this too. So uh, just to know, I know there are folks on here that aren't in California, but since we're the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence, um, there was a law that they tried to pass um, to ban selling violent video games to minors. Um, that law did not move forward. Um, instead, there is the law that um, it just needs to uh, have very clear labeling um, in regards to um, like what the rating system is um, in the rating system. You know, if you've seen like M for mature, that type of thing. It's a self-regulated board um, that assigns age and like content ratings to consumer video games in the U.S. and Canada. Um, this actually kind of turned into a court case um, in 2009. And with that, um, it was protected by SCOTUS that um, video games are protected by First Amendment rights. Um, it also has been interesting, I discovered yesterday, because news is ever evolving, um, that there is a push. Um, hold on, I just want to make sure I'm getting this 100% correctly, because as I said, I was reading about this yesterday, um, that there is a gun company, unfortunately, reportedly made um, a deal with some game makers to market guns to kids um and that is allowed to happen um which is a little scary um and kind of <laughs> seems um a little uh contra indicated to what we were just saying about how violence can only be cannot be attributed only to certain factors but obviously we don't want things <laughs> um like guns marketed directly to minors um and it's the ban was blocked under appeals because of the right for youth to use firearms under supervision. Um, it's also important to remember that each state has different legislature, but we're talking about uh, California here. And also just wanted to point out, um, again, with some of the known harms, um, Gamergate, because not everything is just black and white. There's There's multiple sides to things. Um, Gamergate is a misogynistic alt-right harassment campaign that tries to um, threaten and reveal uh, personal information of certain individuals to a broader community that could cause them harm. Um, so that is a real thing. And uh, social media platforms in general aren't really good at discerning hate speech from uh, First Amendment rights. Um, there is, I mean, people do have the right to say what they want but not necessarily from the consequences of those words and of um the ability for private organizations to maybe uh address threats um and we know that violence against women and gender non-conforming folks which is what gamergate tends to do um is a precursor to all sorts of violence um in that there was recent studies with adults, there are those gaps in research that Miranda was saying, um, but that a lot of female and gender non-conforming video gamers will hide their identities online and not um, display their religion or, uh, sorry, I don't know why I said religion, gender, well, also religion, pronouns, that sort of thing in order to protect themselves. Um, and, but, on that note, we're going to now talk about positive things again. So 
it's thinking about how much, as particularly during the early days of the pandemic, how much it increased in terms of people using video games as an outlet because they were, um, for folks who were able to stay home, um, but also for folks whose, whose jobs were shut down, um, you know, it was being able to have a sense of connection and community as folks were going through uh, online gaming and there was a definite increase uh, in video game usage, particularly with the online. Um, I am a Pokemon Go player. Um, it gets people outside. It's, you know, a very much a come as you are. Um, when I had first moved to Sacramento, that's actually how I became connected in the community, um, meeting my partner, my roommate, a lot of friends, learning the city. Um, it became a way to interact with people. And uh, through that, I met a lot of folks who, this is how they're maintaining their sobriety. This is how they're maintaining their mental health. This is what gets them out and in interacting with people to, um, no problem, uh, to be able to, to interact. I've um, there were folks in our team on in our group who um, had really severe PTSD, who were veterans, um, and this was a way for them to interact um, with others and to connect. Um, so it was. There can be positives. There can be negatives, of course. Um, also, there's the benefits that have been shown, and I can find the studies around critical thinking and design skills. Uh, improving hand-eye coordination, and uh, particularly for folks who have different um, disabilities, um, neurodivergent folks, that it can, again, create space where they can interact in a safe environment. Um, particularly like through Minecraft, there's huge amounts of connection there. Um, and it's not to say that any one game is going to be better than any other. Um, and for some folks, being able to get their aggression, like there's been studies around being able to get aggression out through a video game and not acting that out in society. So all that to say, um, games are games are complicated. Um, and when we look at games like Grand Theft Auto, I know that a lot of times is brought up and I have had a lot of converse. I love that you met your husband through Minecraft. Um, like with Grand Theft Auto, it's a way for folks to be able to connect with others. And um, looking at kind of how those stories have evolved was one of the conversations that we frequently have when I was working with youth in particular through um, the juvenile hall or uh, any of the teams that I, I used to work with in a local program was being able to talk about, okay, what are those relationships and what are some of those dynamics that you see in terms of the characters? And that would open up an avenue to be able to have conversations where I wasn't demonizing the games, but just acknowledging what those, what was, what was taking place and kind of how it's evolved. Pass it on back. Awesome. And then with that, actually, that's the last um, that Miranda and I have in terms of background. I would really like to introduce our fabulous speaker now, Drew, um, and have him be able to share um, about his organization and about now um, going into uh, those gaming as prevention uh, items. And where are my controls? Oh, here we go. I will stop share and I will give it to Drew. Hello, uh, thank you for being here. I'm Drew Crescenti, Executive Director of Jennifer Ann's Group, uh, nonprofit 501c3. I am going to share my screen, hopefully successfully. And let's see if you can see my presentation. So, um, our primary program is Gaming Against Violence. And so I'm here to talk about how video games can be used as a violence prevention tool. First, um, I, I use this phrase to describe our games. And so I wanna break this down because these are not the games that you will necessarily be hearing about on the news. They're certainly not 
Grand Theft Auto or, or Minecraft. Our games are intentionally designed, pro-social, bespoke video games. Intentional. These are purposefully created to accomplish something beyond mere entertainment or profit. Pro-social, behavior or intent to be benefit others, promoting behavior that's beneficial to society. Bespoke, they're custom made for a, a purpose in our case. And video games, unlike the, the, the definition that was used a, a little bit earlier, when we're talking about video games, we're basically talking about digital games. And when we say games, uh, you could think of uh, kids running around as having fun. But once they start playing tag, it's a game because there are goals and constraints. The goal is to catch the person who's it. And there's any number of constraints depending on the neighborhood you're playing in and the rules they have about how to play tag. So when we're talking about video games, we're talking about digital games. Um, basically recognizing that there's constraints and there's also goals or things you're trying to achieve. Let me move that over. Okay. So um, I have a lot to cover. This is a unique group for me to speak to. <clears throat> and so I'm really excited to be able to speak to, to this type of group, people who already are, are focused on intimate partner violence, uh, our focus at Jennifer Ann's group is teen dating violence, just one, one form of intimate partner violence. And so I usually have to spend a lot more time talking about why IPV matters. And I'm, I'm not going to have to do that with you. But I am going to try and provide some background information so that you can uh, ha have not only a better understanding of why we use games, but also the process we went through in order to get there. So broadly, I'm going to talk about our organization. Our focus is teen dating violence or dating violence and some of the challenges associated with trying to do that. Then why we started using games, so our Gaming Against Violence program. Then I'll go into the frameworks, theories, supporting research. Um, I'll focus some on the consent games. Uh, those are some of the games that have had the largest impact for us. And then if time permits, uh, we have some brief playthroughs of several of the games I'll be mentioning, and then we're going to make sure and leave time for Q&A. And I'll also tell you that at the very end of the presentation, there will be a link and a QR code. If you go to that, there is a downloadable three-page PDF that will have citations and links and more information about many of the things that I'm going to talk about. So you won't have to worry about trying to capture everything. And you'll also be able to see citations for some of the information that I'm going to be sharing with you. So our focus is preventing teen dating violence. We do so through awareness, education, and advocacy since 2006. Now, as so often is the case when you hear about a nonprofit organization that has the name of a person, our organization is also associated with a tragedy. And so Jennifer Ann is my daughter, Jennifer Ann Crescenti. And when she was a senior in high school, her ex-boyfriend shot her to death. Um, this obviously came as a huge surprise to me. I had no idea that teen dating violence was as pervasive or as dangerous as it is. And I had any number of conversations with, uh, with Jen about some very uncomfortable topics like smoking, and drinking, and yes, even sex. I did not talk about teen dating violence. It was not on my radar. Uh, this is the last photo of Jennifer and myself. Uh, you can see in the background the suitcase, the handle from the suitcase. I was getting ready to take her to the airport. Uh, did not know this was our last photo. She probably wouldn't appreciate that I was sharing this photo but it obviously has a lot of meaning to me. So I'm not alone in not realizing that teen dating violence is so dangerous. 81% of parents are either unaware of or do not believe that teen dating violence is a problem. Again, the citations will be on the fact sheet at the end. Um, at the same time, by the time they have graduated from college, 
44% of students in the US will have been in an abusive relationship. These numbers uh, should not exist together in the same universe. This does not make sense. So I created Jennifer Ann's group. I did not know what else to do. Jennifer is my only child. So not only did I lose my child, I also lost my identity. I lost my purpose. I was no longer a parent. I know I will always be a parent, but day to day, I was no longer a parent. I did not know what to do about that. Everything I tried to do was meaningless. It became really important to me, not only to continue to feel like I was being a parent, but also to prevent other families from going through this just really un unspeakable, terrible harm. So our focus for uh, preventing teen dating violence is to increase awareness about TDV. One of the interesting things that I found when Jennifer was first killed I, I had a traditional job at the time and coworkers said, what happened? I said, it was teen dating violence. They would have to parse through that label, teen dating violence. They were not familiar with it. And they said, oh, is that a thing? I said, yeah, apparently, I mean, it is a thing. And obviously I've learned more about how much of a thing it is. Beyond increasing awareness about TDV, also provide educational information for teens themselves, for parents, and also for teachers. We know that teachers are one of the groups of trusted adults that young people will often turn to and get advice. We also know that they might see in the classroom or in the hallways some unhealthy behavior, some potentially uh, some potential warning signs about a, a, a relationship that is abusive. So teens, parents, and teachers. Then change unhealthy attitudes or beliefs, and also advocate for educational policies and protective orders. Unfortunately, temporary protective orders in this country were, or were formed around domestic violence. And domestic violence means different things to different people, but the, the legislatures who created protective orders very often would say, you can only get this type of protective order. This is somebody that you have children with, or you are married to, or you live with, the kind of things that would not apply to a 15 or 16 year old in high school. So now most of the states do allow for protective orders, and this has been slowly evolving. And the other legislative issue that we've focused on is having states pass laws requiring that School districts, for example, have formal policies regarding teen dating violence. So if a young person goes to the nurse or a counselor and says, I'm being abused or I'm being stalked or I'm being whatever, that instead of them saying, oh, I wonder what I should do, they open up the manual and they turn to the page that says, this is what you do if there's teen dating violence. Just like this is what you do if there's a blizzard or an earthquake, right? We need to have formal policies. And so we did assist in getting Texas in 2008, requiring that all school districts did have formal policies about teen dating violence. So not necessarily educating teens about this, but that the school districts themselves had policies and regulations. So what we tried to do, very small, I'm doing this out of my house. I do have a technology background. The very first thing I did, I created a website. Um, a lot of that was self-preservation. It was something I knew how to do, and that's what I did in the week or two after Jen was killed. I just created a website. I turned to what I knew how to do. I tried to feel like I had some power over a situation in which I had no power. So some traditional outreach efforts. We now have several websites. Also social media. We created educational cards, little plastic cards with warning signs of a potentially abusive relationship. We also created bookmarks. Bookmark, bookmarks were a lot cheaper to produce. Um, startling statistic on the front, on the back, it's got a ruler, it's got commonly misspelled words, it's got math formulas, and then it's got the 10 warning signs of an abusive relationship and the toll-free number for the National Teen Dating Abuse Helpline. The idea was have them keep this because the math formulas and the ruler and all of that but then when they needed it, they had the warning signs and they knew where to call for help. 
So between the cards and the bookmarks, we have distributed over a half million of those throughout the US uh, at no charge. Uh, but there's several issues with that. One of the issues is that every time people order the cards or the bookmarks, we have to pay for them. Then we have to pay to ship them. We also have to store them in my house. We have to pack them up. We have to do all of those things. So I wanted to find something that was maybe digital, something where if they ordered 100,000 of them, I didn't have to go purchase 100,000 of this thing and ship it to people. It, because if it's digital, it just scales effortlessly. And it also keeps working while I'm asleep. So we tried any number of things, digital things and otherwise, to uh, try and reach young people. Because part of the problem with, with all of these other things, the websites, the cards, the bookmarks, that meant we had to have an organization or a school that had enough interest about teen dating violence for them to go online, search for information, find us, order these things, and then share them with teens. It's like, okay, I need something that, uh, that has them coming, not looking for us, because this is something that has very little awareness, but instead maybe they're wanting to seek us out or, or there's something more. I tried a t-shirt design comp competition and um, it was cool. We got a cool design out of it. Didn't really get the traction I wanted. Poster design challenge. And I've seen a lot of organizations do things like this. Uh, after Jen was killed, uh, I did go ahead and attend law school in order to become a better advocate. So while I was in law school, we had a law school paper writing challenge. Again, I was trying whatever I could, uh, basically the strategy of throw everything at the wall and see if anything sticks. Problem, you know, continued to be. Parents were still unaware. Schools, even if they did have this mandate to either uh, have formal policies or to teach this information in their schools, these, these mandates were either unfunded or the school districts were generally underfunded. And Unfortunately, at least in the US, we have a very unhealthy culture when it comes to how we portray violence. Um, it's not just video games, uh, it's also movies, it's books, it's music. It's a lot of things that we would not want our children to engage in, but that we have storylines that often regard this behavior as aspirational. So these are significant challenges for us to overcome. I so said, how about video games? At the time, um, you know, Angry Birds had been really popular. I was like, wow, if we had a game like Angry Birds that people really loved the, the puzzle aspect of it, and they were just playing this all the time on their phone, we could have little factoids on the side. Teen dating violence, here's some warning signs. Because they're enjoying the game, they'll be reading the messaging. So my, my approach at that time, or what I was hoping we could, we could achieve, was, was fairly limited. It was basically um, more about some knowledge transfer and increasing awareness. But if that worked, that'd be great because here with games, meet teens where they are. Instead of asking them to come to me, why not go to where they are? And as you saw earlier, the statistics, a lot of teens play games. A lot of other people play games too. I'll point out, I very often will hear from someone, oh, I never play games. And I'll say, well, do you play solitaire on your phone? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, that is a game. So the, 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 I, the sense of people that people have about who a gamer is, um, I think it's good for us to maybe uh, think about how we've kind of defined that ourselves and think about if you are playing games and that might not make you a gamer, but it does make you somebody who does play games for, they all play them for different purposes and yours might be, you've got an extra five minutes. And that's it. Theirs might be they're very devoted to this game. So um, the other thing about video games is we know that teens prefer this medium. If they prefer the medium, that means they're going to be more receptive to the lessons learned rather than having somebody talk to them or talk down to them. This is somebody, this is something that will meet them right where they are without judgment because it's a game. And then the other thing was maybe the media would cover this if I said, we're going to prevent violence with video games. So, I mean, why not? Now, I, at that time in 2008, creating video games is very, very different than it is today. 
Today, there's many platforms and there's many independent game developers that are able to create games without necessarily getting into all of the uh, really complicated and involved development that you that you needed to get into at that time. I didn't know how to make a game. I have a technology background, but I had no idea what I how I would create one. And I did not know what that game would look like if I if I could create one. And I didn't have the budget to hire people because games can be very expensive. Um, they have games that would budgets uh, certainly the tens of millions of dollars. So I didn't have tens of thousands of dollars. So I said, well, okay, why don't I have a contest? Because out in the world, there will be people who will have very clever ideas about teen dating violence and how to create games around that. And I will offer $1,000 to have somebody in the world create a game that we can then use to promote this. And let's see if this works. So in 2008, the Life Love Game Design Challenge was born. And I came up with this rule at the very, very beginning is that these games could not have any violence in them. And there's several benefits to it. My initial thinking was, okay, this was Hollywood, just like a Hollywood movie. The beginning of the game, some terrible tragedy is going to occur. Your sister or your friend or somebody like that is going to be killed. And you spend the rest of the game trying to track down the killers and get your revenge. Okay, that is not the space we wanted to be in at all. The other thing is there's something intriguing about this. Can you create a game about teen dating violence without using any violence in the game itself? That constraint, for one thing, is going to require that the game developers be more creative. And for another, again, I was hoping the media would, would, would appreciate this and would want to write about it. And we've run this contest every year since. I will say we did get media coverage that first year, including a, a, a very brief blurb in Newsweek, of all things. OK, so this was something for me to stick with, because we did get a few entries that year. We got one game that, was, that worked well enough that we were able to give some prize money, and we were able to share that game. Um, the topics have changed every year. Uh, the first several years, it was strictly teen dating violence. Since then, we've gotten a number of topics that either fit under the IPV umbrella or deal with uh, protective factors that would help prevent violence generally. Um, our games, are they're all trauma-informed. We strive to be inclusive. The reality is we're very limited in, in, in our resources, and so we will continue to work to be more inclusive, but we recognize that we're not quite there yet. Uh, we have now produced and published dozens of these games. The games have come from close to 20 different countries, uh, including Russia and Ukraine, for example, but all from Argentina to Vanuatu, India, Ireland, many countries, a wide variety of game types. Most have been uh, narrative games, so basically they're telling stories and that you're making decisions which will then branch the direction the story goes in. You can think of uh, choose your own adventure style books. Depending on your age, you may or may not be familiar with those. Um, and the games are not no longer, our goals are no longer just limited to awareness and education. And the things that are blue, those are things I have a slide on later, so I won't elaborate on it till I get to that slide. So that's a reminder to me. So uh, unfortunately, many of these games that we've published aren't available anymore. One of the problems with being on the cutting edge is that uh, the technology you're using might not be around forever. <laughs> and so if you're familiar with Flash, most of our games were Flash-based at the time. And those are games that you could play in your browser. But uh, for a couple of years now, Flash has not been available anymore. One of those Flash games we have converted to a game that you can install if you have Windows. You can install it and play it. But it is a fairly cumbersome process. And so it's going to be a little while before we can get make the other games available. I would say in this graphic here, uh, the one in the bottom center that says Grace's Diary, that's the one we've converted. All of these other games are Flash-based. 
So right now they reside on my computer or on our server. Uh, unfortunately, they are not publicly available right now, but we will get there because I do have the source code and I do have the licensing rights for all of these games. So the different topics that we have focused on, bystander awareness, connectedness, that's the theme for next year's contest, consent, 2017, the consent games have really had a huge impact. <clears throat> Excuse me, critical thinking, that was the topic for this year. And we will be releasing the first winning game, critical thinking game later this month in October. So it's called Mushroom. So look out for that. It's a very clever, cute game. And we're, we're, we're hoping it's gonna be played in a lot of classrooms. Cultural impact. So this is really, what impact has your culture had on what you regard as a, a healthy relationship? What's acceptable behavior in a relationship? And how about gender roles? And, you know, are these traditional gender roles or are we treating everybody um, equally, or at least uh, striving to do so? Uh, gaslighting, healthy relationships. We have a game called Honeymoon that I will talk a little bit more about later, but that really uh, has been very successful for us in terms of classroom use to get them to uh, allow young people to see what a healthy relationship looks like. Media literacy, very important. Um, and we have a dedicated website for uh, a media literacy game, which will be in the, the links later. Power and control, which is you know, the underlying dynamic behind abusive relationships. Resilience, and this is another protective factor. And that was the, the theme last year. We've released two resilience games so far. We have three more to release. We're hoping to release one of those resilience games in November. And then teen dating violence itself, you know, games where it's a narrative based game and you're learning about the warning signs of a potentially abusive relationship through that game. The process for the contest, and I'll go over this fairly quickly, February's Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. That's when we announce the contest and whatever the rules are for that year. We for the past six years or so, have divided the contest into two stages. Uh, I found that people were submitting games and they were spending many, many hours on creating a game where they were not, they were way off the mark. They were not really achieving what we were looking for. So now what I've, I've done is I have a two-stage process where stage one, they submit a game pitch. So it's just answers to questions. And they just have to write text. This is my idea. This is how I'm going to do this, this, and this. Go through all of those game pitches and we pick a dozen or so to be finalists because we know they're on track. They get it. They're, they're going to do what it is we're looking for. And we don't want the people who don't get that to invest too much time in it. So then we give them, depending on the, the year and the contest and what our budget is like, three to five months for the finalists to develop those games. We then have between about 12 and 16 judges every year uh, who are subject matter experts in one form or another, either when it comes to game design, many of them are uh, professors that teach game design at universities, mostly in the US, but also in Europe. Or we have people who work with domestic violence organizations or are psychologists or school counselors. So we try and get a mix of both of those types of groups uh, but for example, when we had resilience, we tried to bring in some people who are experts with resilience, including um, somebody, I'm in Atlanta, somebody else who lives in Atlanta who produces a video series that appears on PBS. It's an Emmy Award uh, winning, Emmy Award winning series about resilience. And so he was a judge last year for resilience. So depending on the year, we try and bring in different uh, types of experts. And then we adapt the games. Once we select the winning games, we adapt them based on the critiques from those judges. So first of all, obviously, if there's something traumatizing. We address that to the extent that we can uh, be more, um, you know, we, we can recognize all types of people. If possible, we try and, and bring that into the game. And then we look at the critiques from the judges. And some sometimes it, it only takes 
a month or two for us to get that game ready to publish. Sometimes it takes much, much longer. There are games from several years ago that still have not been published, and we hope to publish them one day, but it will take some time. But Mushroom, I think we announced the winning games in September, and we're releasing it in October. So for us, that's a quick turnaround, and that's great. Um, and it'd be great if we could do that more often. And then, as I said, we publish them once they're ready. Something we've started doing more of, but really want to do much more of, is also creating guides for parents and resources for classrooms. We've only done that a few times, but last year's Resilience Game One New Message, we did release a two-page lesson plan that standards aligned to California and to Georgia. We use California because many other states look to California. And we use Georgia because that's where I'm, I am, and we want to try and get those games into the classroom here. Um, and that game, by the way, is actually on, on PBS now. If you are watching this Emmy Award winning series called Hope Givers about resilience, under the resources, they now have one new message as a game. So it's really exciting to see that that's something that's available through PBS now. You know, we, we, we love that. Um, Right now for Mushroom, we have an educator who's currently working on lesson, a lesson plan for when we release Mushroom, we'd like to release the lesson plan at the same time. Now, originally, you know, it was about awareness and knowledge transfer. 2010, we had this game that changed, that really changed this for me. It changed how I perceived these games and what they were truly capable of. The game's called Grace's Diary, and this is the game that has been converted to a game that you can now install. So it was flash-based. And um, during COVID at some point, I kind of lost track of all that time, but during COVID at some point, that was the one that we went ahead and, and created it. So you could install it on a Windows computer, only Windows for now, and experience this game. Came from, the game came from Thailand. I was really excited that we had reached out as far as Thailand. and. Also, I was fortunate when I was a kid to um, go to elementary school for two years in Bangkok. So I was excited about that as well. And this game really resonated with people. These characters, the players really cared about them. And one of the reasons for that is that the protagonist in the story, the main character, the one that you're controlling, they are not the target of abuse. It's their friend who is. And that's really important. And that makes a difference because it's a lot safer as the player or as, or as a parent who's evaluating this game or an educator evaluating this game that the young person is not, oh, I'm, I'm in an abusive relationship and I'm having to contend with abuse. Instead, it's like, I'm worried about my friend. The other thing is sometimes when I talk about teen dating violence, parents will say, my team doesn't date and they won't date till whatever absurd age that is unrealistic. And there's no point in me arguing with them because then we're having the wrong conversation. So instead I say, do they have friends who date? Because if they know about teen dating violence, then maybe if their friend comes to them for advice, they know where to point them, or maybe they can help identify the warning signs of an abusive relationship. So, this friend aspect is safer in a lot of ways. And I think it's a good strategy when you're dealing with uh, traumatic uh, storylines or just trying to be trauma informed. And then the game itself, it, it, just this delicate sketch, uh, sketchy art style and pleasant music, um, very straightforward game mechanics. The story is, this is Grace here. And it's her friend, Natalie, that after, since she started dating Ken, last summer their relationship has become a bit strained their friendship has she's she's not as as accessible and it seems like maybe she's not doing as well in school some some things that are you know possible red flags but she says she realizes if i call natalie up and say hey i think ken's bad for you well that's not going to work natalie's going to say oh you're just jealous right so she says you know what i need to do is i need to I need to search my memory for, for certain incidents that I've observed that have been unacceptable or unhealthy in some way. And I'm gonna keep a note in my diary 
it's Grace's diary. I'm going to keep a note for all of these things I identify. And once I've come up with enough of these things, I'm going to call Natalie on the phone. I'm going to have a conversation with her. So you're just searching Grace's room. And a lot of the things are, oh gosh, why do I still have that in here? I need to throw it away. But some of the things are, uh, this is a flyer from a party that she and Natalie went to. She said, oh, wait a second, I remember what happened at that party. And then you flash back to that story and you see unhealthy behavior. So after that flashback, then Grace writes in her diary, this is what happened at that party. And so as she explores her room, she continues to write things in her, in her pad. And once she has enough of those, then she could say, I think I'm ready to make that phone call. And when she makes that phone call, depending on if you found enough things in the room, the dialogue will branch in different directions. And depending on all the things you found and how that dialogue branches, there's three possible endings to the story. And in only one of them does Natalie leave this abusive relationship. So I do try and point out to people there's three possible endings. Please play it again. Because a lot of the reviews said, I can't stand this. I can't believe she went back to him. And you know, we know the reality is it's not easy to leave an unhealthy relationship. We know the reality is that people leave many times to be back in that relationship. And that takes six times or so before they really have left forever. So we do encourage them to experience these different endings. One of the nice things is they're experiencing them safely because this is not the real world. This is the world where you can make the wrong decision and it doesn't cost you your life. So here's some of the artwork to, to give you a, a sense of this game, this very low key, sweet, endearing game with characters that uh, have resonated with a lot of players. And I don't know if you're familiar with Wired, but I was really surprised to see a review in Wired from somebody named Geek Dad. And one of the things he said, I was surprised how much I learned about my own relationships, as well as having some really useful conversations with my family about establishing healthy boundaries. I said, this is brilliant. Here's an adult with kids who had not realized that he had ever been in unhealthy relationships until he played this game. Very meaningful to me. And then I found reviews that people were leaving on like gaming websites. And I'll just read a couple of them to you. Everybody should see this immediately, please. And these are teenagers writing these reviews. Wow. That was wow. Any game that makes my thoughts switch over to capital letters most of the time is truly amazing. This game does immerse you into its world if you allow it. Please allow it. So these were kids wanting other kids to play this game, to learn these messages. And I was, I was blown away. And I said, okay, so beyond awareness and education, um, I guess we could use these games to persuade. So if people already had existing unhealthy attitudes or beliefs regarding gender roles or relationships, maybe we can change those after they play the game through the process of playing the game. Of course, we want change in attitudes and beliefs to then become a change in actions, but you know, one step at a time. So a little bit about framework theories and supporting research. As I've explained somewhat, the process that has led me here has been very organic. Uh, it's great and that's terrible. Um, I mean, the good thing is I'm not a person who said, uh, we've got a, a technology solution for everything and I'm here to make a, do a dollar from you. So, you know, buy my solution. No. I'm, I'm somebody who is trying to prevent teen dating violence. And if you have a better approach to doing that, that takes into account, you know, uh, the scarcity of resources at schools and the lack of awareness amongst parents, I will, I will use that other solution. 
I'm doing this because I'm very mission focused. And as far as I can tell, this is the best approach given all of those constraints right now. Um, the disadvantage is that, for example, I went to law school instead of going and getting an MPH instead. Well, okay. I thought criminal justice would be a, a great path for me. I was surprised how little they talked about domestic violence in law school. I started a law school organization actually to so that people who are going to become lawyers and prosecutors and DAs and judges would have to learn about domestic violence before they were practicing law or before they were adjudicating cases. Um, and, um, but, you know, live and learn. So I probably should have gotten MPH. But uh, the other thing is that it's very, it is multidisciplinary. Um, not only the path that I've taken, but the people that I've tried to surround myself, myself with because I recognize my limitations. I recognize what I do and don't know. I don't always know what I don't know, but as soon as I'm aware of it, I try and learn it. So we are primarily very public health focused. Uh, I'm fortunate to be a member of IPRICE, the Injury Prevention Research Center at Emory. I've been a member of it since before it was called IPRICE. Um, and it's helpful, it's wonderful because it's surrounded with people that are very public health focused. And I'm on the Violence Prevention Task Force. And I'm of course focused on team dating violence. Also uh, a course from Emory called Understanding Violence. The link for this is in the link at the, uh, the, the paper at the end. <clears throat> it's a free course on Coursera. Over 30,000 people have taken this and it's talking about different aspects of violence and the value of learning about it. And uh, also talks about some different prevention techniques. And I'm fortunate to be one of the people speaking uh, one of the later modules about using video games to prevent violence. And the course also includes Jimmy Carter not, not in my section, but they have an interview with Jimmy Carter about, you know, promoting peace. <clears throat> it's an excellent course. I would suggest everybody take it. It's free. So uh, we generally follow the social ecological model. Uh, I'm in Atlanta. The CDC is in Atlanta. So a lot of the things the CDC does, I try to do in part because I'm surrounded by CDC people. Uh, also social determinants of health, recognizing obviously the impact of, of of many things around us, that there's there's limits to what we can do about the situations that people have, the environments they've grown up in, their family life. Um, this is a cross-cutting approach. And uh, we also try to focus on uh, you know, adverse childhood experiences, um, ACEs. And I know some people are now using PACEs to include positive as well. ACEs connection, I, I, I have written stuff on there about what we do, and they're now called Paces Connection. So I, I understand the, the value of including the positive uh, childhood experiences as well. So in terms of cross-cutting, you know, what does resilience have to do with this? What does critical thinking have to do with preventing teen dating violence? You know, we are addressing the root causes of, of violence. Um, I, I'm, I also do things with every town and mom's demand, and they're very, very focused on gun violence prevention. I, I wish that they would expand to include more of these cross-cutting things because I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, so resilience, that's, you know, uh, that's a protective factor. And those were the games that we focused on last year. We have two so far, three more to come. So there'll be five resilience games. Critical thinking is this year. And we hope to publish six of those games. But we have three winning games. So we'll publish one this year. By this month, I mean, connectedness, that's the topic next year that we're focused on. And empathy, so many of the narrative games, uh, in, I mean, empathy is, is a really important aspect of it. It allows for perspective taking. And I'm talking beyond just cognitive empathy. Our, our, our focus is really to try and um, have people uh, relate to the emotions involved as opposed to just recognize it cognitively. And the social ecological model, you know, the different levels, it's difficult for us to hit all of these levels, but this is the CDC's model. And at the individual level, we certainly promote healthy attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. Uh, one of the games that we published earlier this year for resilience, uh, it does focus on conflict resolution skills. 
based on choosing different communication strategies. That game's called Unearth. Social emotional learning, of course, is a big part of what we're focused on. And then healthy relationship skills. Um, those games that do talk about dating relationships like honeymoon, that is a, a, a key factor for us. And then at the relationship level, promoting healthy relationships and strengthening communication and problem solving. Community, this is more difficult. Uh, to the extent that we can, we do want to improve so the social environment in schools. Uh, it, you know, that's a much harder sell for us because us getting games into a school district, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a significant challenge. I will be able to share with you how um, we did pilot, a pilot study with one of our games in a school district. So um, again, that's, that's very difficult for us to achieve. And then changing social and, and cultural norms, we not, might not be changing them, but we can certainly work toward that, uh, showing what behavior is and is not acceptable. I think that's critically important. So a little research. Um, I was speaking at a, a conference of uh, Games for Health in Europe in 2013, I believe. Um, and somebody else was speaking about using a video game to prevent teen dating violence. And I was shocked. I've been doing this five years at this point. I'd never heard of anybody trying to do this. And I happened to be giving a seminar in London and the person who was heading this up was in London. So reached out to her. I said, while I'm here, can I take a train to Coventry and meet with you? She said, sure. And so we talked. Um, this was an EU initiative. And unfortunately, the, the funding was only for um, to create a, a, a pilot study, really. So they never were able to create a game that was published, uh, released to the public. But Dr. Erica Bowen, great. She's been a judge for our contest several times, but she's been a big help. Um, and their game was called Green Acres High, an EU initiative in the UK, Belgium, Germany, and Sweden. And this study, there's the, the link is in the, the document at the end of the presentation, but the name of the study is, it's like you're actually playing as yourself. Development and preliminary evaluation of Green Acres High, a serious game-based primary intervention to combat adolescent dating violence, which is essentially what I've been talking about all this time. And they, they, the findings showed, control uh, compared to the control, the people who played their game in Belgium, Germany, and Sweden, and obvious, this is, uh, I call it the low hanging fruit, the, the, the knowledge of DV increased, but we would expect that. But it was nice to see the aggression, generally physical and verbal aggression, all were lower uh, in, in, with the game as compo compared to the control game. And then uh, in Sweden alone, they did uh, an, another, uh, they had additional information. I'm just being aware of my time. So um, again, it just showed significant changes uh, for the most part. And conceptually, these games, especially since there's an intentionality behind them when they're created, it supports experiential learning. So if you're reading a book, you're not really engaging. So there's not really action. Instead, it's like, um, just explanation of what's happening in the story. But with a game, you are actively involved. And I think that's good for all games and applicable to all. But when we're talking about emotional health uh, focused games or apps, it's really important, I think, discovery learning. So as opposed to just being given this information in a game, you often have to seek things out. So here we're exploring different things in a game in order to learn these things. So again, you are making this happen. And so you have greater investment in making that happen. It's not a brochure that you're reading where somebody's speaking at you with it. And also uh, contextualized learning is huge, especially when we're talking about difficult, nuanced topics. You're learning about this in context. It's not isolated because especially if it's a narrative game, you understand all of the dynamics around what you're learning in that game. So it's in, in context. And then when we're talking about young people, they prefer this technology, they prefer these tools, and they appreciate 
that their preferences were considered in the first place. What that means is that they're much more likely to be receptive and open to those lessons that they learn. And when we're talking about sensitive issues like dating or consent, that's really important. And again, they're playing this game alone. Nobody's judging them. The game's not judging them. They're not talking to mom, dad, teacher, or counselor who they might feel like will judge them if they want to explore something. The game has no judgment. So I wonder, do our games work? I mean, it's wonderful seeing all of this information, but I want to find out if they are effective. So I decided to do my own study. And I wasn't thinking of it as a study. I was thinking it, of it as, let's prove to myself our games do what I'm hoping they do. Some background, my mom's a psychologist. So I grew up thinking things that maybe other kids didn't think in terms of what common knowledge, what people commonly knew. Uh, in eighth grade, my science fair project was uh, classical and operant conditioning on guinea pigs. <laughs> So, and I got an honorable mention at the county level. So that was great. But to me, doing something like this was just a way of proving to myself. And um, I am Turk, if you're not familiar with it, Mechanical Turk, it's something where you can reach out to people. It's a service through Amazon, but it's a very quick and easy way of finding a lot of people if you need to. So I got 86 unguided players. They played five of our games and then one control game. And all of the people, all of the game players who played our games changed their attitude positively, but the control group showed no increase. I took all of my data and I said, this looks meaningful to me, but I don't know. So I gave it to a, a, a real researcher in the Netherlands who's become a good friend. And he said, you're almost a researcher. This is good. And he was able to put all of that together and we were able to get that published and the link for that is in there as well. That same person as part of his dissertation, he went ahead and did a study himself. He was at Erasmus University at the time, uh, playing against abuse, effects of procedural and narrative persuasive games. So these were two teen dating violence games, but they were different styles, narrative. I've talked about some procedural rhetoric. I won't, I won't explain what that is, um, but it's just a different style of communicating a message without being so obvious about how you're communicating it. And what it found is he was wanting to see one was much more successful than the other, found out that they were equally successful. So I was pleased. These were both games of ours, teen dating violence games, compared to the control game. So uh, the link for that is in there as well. But both of these games were shown to be more effective in terms of changing or impacting unhealthy attitudes regarding teen dating violence as compared to the control. Honeymoon. So this is the game that we did a pilot study uh, in El Paso, Texas, because that's where my mother is. She's a psychologist and she knows all the superintendents of the school districts and they know her and they respect her. So we were able to get a, a, do a pilot study in one of the school districts, uh, El Paso Independent School District. At that time, the game was available in English and Spanish. Made changes to the game now, so it's only in English until we have somebody come in and help us with the Spanish parts of it. And we hired an educator to create lesson plans for this game, and she created over 30 pages of lesson plans. Fantastic job. I'm still just so pleased with the work that she did. And so in 2017, we did this, and um, we had about a half dozen schools. We made it available to middle schools and high schools. Only about a half dozen participated. I would have loved more, but I was happy to have any. And here's quotes from two of the counselors. One said, I am absolutely in love with this project, and I think the idea is an amazing idea for high school teens. The other said, this program went above and beyond my expectations. I look forward to continue using this product in the near future. That's awesome. Um, we did give the educators and counselors a pre and post survey to see how, how, they, how well they thought the game did. I mean, the great thing was there was nothing they wanted to change. The bad thing was th there was nothing they wanted to change because we really did want some feedback so that we could improve upon the lesson plans or the game, but they loved it. So uh, very pleased with this, but we are very eager to, to expand further.
um, in terms of uh, more pilot testing. Right now, our games, to me, feel more like resources as opposed to a program. So that's uh, important to me, and we, we, we hope to achieve that. We just had our annual fundraiser this past weekend, and the superintendents from the three school districts all attended our fundraiser, our dinner. So, I was, okay, that's a good sign. We're gonna we're gonna test this in more schools. Um, next steps. I do need a longitudinal study because I know changing an attitude or or belief at this moment is one thing. Changing their actions, that's another thing. For that, we need a longitudinal study. Um, that's not in my budget. Uh, I have uh, I continue to apply for grants. But you know, our, our hope would be that we could follow up at three months, six months, maybe nine months, and then a year to see if we've actually seen a change in 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 their their them either perpetrating violence or themselves being the target of abuse in a relationship. Also, want to do a study just on our consent games because those consent games continue to be our, amongst our most popular. And then also just continue to refine the game mechanic strategies in these games. Consent, big topic, very successful for us. Um, part of the reason it was so successful, everybody was talking about consent. Uh, part of the reason I started the contest is sometimes when they were talking about consent, they were getting it wrong. I was very frustrated by that. So we got game pitches from every continent except Antarctica. Um, the impact of awareness was huge because people already knew about this topic. And last year, just on one of our game platforms, we don't track people because of privacy issues, but one of the game platforms gives us metrics, basic metrics. And I looked at the consent games for last year, we had over 20,000 players. So that's 20,000 people who learned about consent through these games just last year. And that's great. I don't probably have time to talk about um, what we did in terms of defining consent, but basically it's a legal term of art, which is a problem because that means you can go from one jurisdiction to another and consent means something different, but consent means the same thing, but in the eyes of the law, it means something different. So for the contest, we said, this is what consent means. And so all of the games had to follow this definition of consent. And it's, it's basically, it's informed, freely given, actively given, revocable. And then we provided examples for that. We've published six consent games to date. We still have a couple more to publish. What's nice is they're appropriate for a range of age, ages. So Adrift, for example, all ages, never talks about relationships, it never talks about sex, nothing like that. It's consent is a specialized form of permission and it addresses it without having to get into any of the details that mom, dad, or teacher might not want to get into yet. And then how to blurble blobble slightly older, crossing boundaries, and then stuck in a dark place is definitely only for older students. It does have some you know, problematic content. We do have a content warning on it. Um, so how to blurble blobble, the game uh, was successful enough that I received an email from someone in Vanuatu. And I went to Wikipedia to look up, where's Vanuatu? and it's off the coast of New Zealand. And they said, we love this game. Can you create a version of it for us? We, we're, uh, we are with World Vision and we have a budget for this. I was like, I've heard of World Vision. And if you have a budget for this, yes, we can do this. So we created, created a culturally relevant game for young people living in Vanuatu who might not have a computer at home. They might not have a computer lab in the school. They all have smartphones. So we created a game designed for them to be able to play it on their phone. And this gets me, because um, these are people on the other side of the world playing a game that has Jennifer's name associated with it. And so um, it's, it was an honor to be able to do this. And it's something that I, I hope that we can continue to achieve more and more often. And similarly, the consent game Adrift was contacted by a museum in Australia. He said, we would love to create a life-size version of this for people coming to the museum to learn about consent. I was like, uh, sure, absolutely. And so for an exhibition they did, uh, 
this is what they had in the museum and museum visitors got to learn about consent it was based on our game adrift so somebody tell me uh if we have enough time for me to do any uh playthrough or not um i have brief videos of a few of these games um i don't know okay i'm gonna go ahead and start and then if somebody tells me to stop i will honeymoon so one thing these, these are static videos i don't want to deal with trying to play a game interactively um, you can save your game and you can load your game. I think that's important for school use at the same time. I will say this is a game you really should play, if not in one sitting, you should play it in one day because it's really good to experience the highs and lows of the story. And honeymoon refers to that honeymoon period in a relationship when everything is incredible and it feels like it will always be incredible. And then we get to see how um, that e evolves. So in this game, you can select your gender as the player, as well as the gender of your crush. It is binary. Um, that's something we hope to expand upon in the future, but it does allow for us to recognize that boys can be the target of abuse. It also allows us to recognize that same sexual relationships can certainly be abusive and this is actually one of the issues with the law again is that very often people in same-sex relationships weren't necessarily protected by protective orders because there are these very old-fashioned ideas of what a relationship is so we we have we have included that which is um important and it's a very cute art style and i am definitely skipping ahead but you could see here for example you can make a choices as simple as is it time to get out of bed or not but here we've got a very loving couple that, that are the parents and they have a great relationship with each other and with their child we recognize that is not always the case in this game that's really important and we do address that in the in the lesson plans we do say what if you didn't have a trusted adult what if you didn't have this healthy relationship modeling to 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 grow up with you know, what is the impact of that? Because we know if young people grow up and they don't necessarily see healthy relationship modeling and their parents are in older siblings, they turn to their peers who know as little as they do, or very often they look to the media. And the media will have what they consider to be funny, but is stalking behavior, et cetera, et cetera. It's, 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 it's a minefield out there, but we're not born knowing this. We have to learn it from somewhere. So this, this, this player, this character is, is fortunate in that they've, they've got that. And we also include a best friend and classmates. We wanna see the impacts of an unhealthy relationship on the different people in this person's environment so that you can all, give them all a voice. Um, and here's the crush. If, if you're playing as the boy with a, a female crush, that's her. And it's, it's very sweet but we don't have the time to really go through all the dialogue, but it's very relatable. And every time I play it, I get butterflies in my stomach. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is sweet. And it really is. But you know, the point of the game is that it, it does go beyond that. We also have a younger sister. We get to see the impact on the younger sister when you're having to make decisions about, do you choose to do things with your partner or do you go to your, sis your younger sister's 10th birthday? Um, and here is when things start to go south after a few months she starts to start starts to criticize the clothes that he's wearing they're going to go to a party and he's kind of dressed up why are you wearing that oh because i wanted to look good for you well maybe you're just wanting to look good for everybody else so they don't go to the party now you can choose to go to the party or not but uh, and the story will branch based on it but she's showing jealousy and then when she's talking he's talking to this, his mother he's like you know um jealousy's I think she got jealous um, because of the way I was dressing. Um, and I guess it's cute in some way. That means she really loves me. And the mom sets him straight. <laughs> Jealousy is not cute. You know, this is, this is something for somebody who's, who's insecure who, or who has other issues. This is not acceptable behavior, but it's, it's, it's done in a way that 
It doesn't feel like the hammer's coming down on you. And again, you're just this character. So it's not your parents saying this to you. Um, but this allows the student to experience what was healthy in that relationship and then see when it starts to go south. Um, and again, when you're hanging out with your friend and after you've been playing video games with your friend, you turn your phone back on and you have 37 missed calls. It's like, you know, I, I recognize that um, if you're really texting with someone, 50 text messages in an hour can be acceptable because you're really into it. But sometimes one text message is too much. It all depends on context. And in this context, context it, it was not appropriate. So basically, uh, you get to uh, explore this. And this, again, is the game that has uh, nine minutes left. This is the uh, game that does have 30 pages of lesson plans. So it addresses so many of these things. The lesson plans right now are not publicly available. We only have um, the first section of them available because we're redesigning and kind of revamping them. But if anybody has a school district and they're interested in piloting this, we would make the existing lesson plans available for a pilot study because we really want to continue to improve upon this game. And then I'll show you. Um, I'll just show you a little bit of this. It's hard for me to pick. It's like choosing between my children. So this is, the music is cool. This is one new message, very lo-fi vibes. This is about recognizing when you're stressed. Once you recognize that, coping strategies to reduce your stress and then respond appropriately. This is someone who's won a, a contest in order to go to summer camp for the, for the summer they're going to go to camp never been able to go they're very excited to go so this is like a really big deal to them but this is how many days there's left till camp and they've got to kind of ha get their act together so for example um they one of the primary dynamics here and we use this fairly often is texting because people are familiar with it so you get a phone call you get a actually a text from your mom and says uh, i just talked to your teacher you're failing three of your classes and apparently you're supposed to be sent home with a report uh, notifying me. And it's like, oh, what? Um, I, I don't understand what happened. So this is how the conversation starts to proceed. It was embarrassing for me. You need to think about how your actions reflect on others. What's going on? Why didn't you tell me? Okay, so, so now, when you saw this from your mom, assuming you're the game player, what's going on? Why didn't you tell me about your grades? The knee jerk response is it's none of your business, which is not a good response. So this is a big decision alert. Will you reply without thinking while you're upset and then face the consequences? Or are you gonna put your phone down, come up with a coping skill so that you can unlock another dialogue option? Well. We, of course, are going to do the good thing, which is put the phone down and then look at, look, we can write in a journal, listen to music, chat to a friend, we could get some exercise. In this case, we listen to some music, we listen to something angry, got some of that out of us. And now, and then, oh, by the way, real world tips are included throughout the game. Make a playlist to listen to when you're stressed. So wonderful examples that students can use in the real world to deal with stress. But now, instead of just, it's none of your business, you have the option to say, I'm struggling. And then you talk with your mom about that. Then you go to your part-time job, you go to school. There's several different scenarios. And you, you, you've got to stay on the right track so that you can go to uh, uh, summer camp. So I see I don't have enough time to continue with those games but you can play the games yourself. That way you don't have to listen to me talking about them because you're gonna have the links to play all of those. So here's the, 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 the part where you can scan this funky QR code in, or you can just type in jenniferanorg slash CPEDV2023. And that will be a three page PDF. The hyperlinks in that don't really work correctly. You're gonna cut and paste. I did it in Canvas and I, or Canva, and I don't, I, I don't know why. 
it's a PDF, so just you might want to type it in or cut and paste it. Um, we'll make sure that you still have this link available to you. And <laughs> are there any questions in the whatever 10 seconds I have left or whatever it is? Are there questions for me? Uh, what do I have to, wait, I'll, I'll go to this so you can see. There's our contact info also. Um, and I'll do, I'll, I'll turn off the screen sharing somewhere. Let's see where it is though. I think I might be able to Thank you. <laughs> stop your screen share. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Drew, for that amazing presentation. Um, for folks, uh, thank you for being here. Um, we're really grateful to have had this. I hope you can see Drew all the very positive comments in the chat um, that you are receiving. I am going to, um, with this recording, uh, uh, upload this as well as the resources provided and they will go on our resource library hopefully tomorrow if not tomorrow folks then by next week um, sometimes capacity doesn't always let us do all the things um, the one other thing I'm going to highlight is that we have an upcoming this was our PPN webinar we have an upcoming PPN call um, on diaper need as an economic justice issue next week. So I'm going to stop the recording, but thank you all so much for being here today.